John 20, verse 16. It says, Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which means teacher. She, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go. Everyone say go. Go. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, and and go to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. The name of our Christmas with purpose message today is called The Gift. The Gift. Father, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Can we just begin to worship God? Come on. Happy birthday, early birthday, Jesus. This is Jesus' birthday week. Come on. We are celebrating the birth of our Savior. Where would we be without our Savior? Where would we be without our Savior? Our source is not in our jobs. Our source is not in our paychecks. Our source is not in what people think about us. Our source is connected and tied in Jesus. Holy Spirit, have your way today. Father, I thank you for flooding this place with your glory and your presence. Father, I thank you for heaven to be here. I thank you, Father, for people who have expectations that you would meet them where they are. People who are mourning over the losses of people, family members that are not with us today. Father, I pray that you would be with us. I pray that you would comfort people right now. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that this message would bring transformation to us, that we are reminded that you are a good father, that you are not mad at us, that you love us, and you have a plan for our life. Use me as your vessel. Let me not say anything I'm not supposed to say, and let me say everything that you've called me to say. In Jesus' mighty name, we honor you. If you're in agreement, everyone say amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Raise your hand if Christmas was like your favorite holiday as a kid. Come on now. Christmas was my favorite holiday as a kid. And, you know, if I could be real, um, there was definitely certain family members that we could count on that we knew was going to bring the best gifts every year. Am I alone with that? You could just see the gift under the tree, and you could just see auntie so-and-so or, or cousin so-and-so on, on the present, and it's written to you. You knew it was about to go down. You knew that you were about to come up. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that I'm really, really excited to share with you because there is a gift that, that is waiting for you that surpasses every gift that you can receive this year. And I'm letting you know right now, you can be excited because you are about to come up. You are about to come up because the name on this gift is from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and his name is Jesus. You know, uh, my, my dad used to pull this trick on me almost every Christmas, and it worked. It worked every year. <laughs> it worked every year. I would open up all my gifts, and every single time this, this would work, I, I thought I would be finished. And I would be sitting there, and you know, I, was, I was grateful, but he, you know, my parents, and they, they could see I was pouting a little bit because... I didn't get the thing that I wanted. You know what I'm saying? I'm grateful. This is, this is awesome. But I was, I was kind of hot, like on the low. Like, man, like, dang, maybe next year. You know, like one of those things. And every single time when I thought I was done, my dad would just, oh, hey, I got something else for you. I'm like, huh? And he would go behind something, pull out a, something out of the closet and say, here you go. And it wouldn't just be a gift. It would be like the gift of all gifts. I'm talking about the gift that I wanted the entire time. And I'm here to tell you that the Lord wants you to know that many of us thought we were done opening up all our gifts. Many of us thought we were done opening up all of our spiritual gifts. Many of us believed that we were done opening up all the blessings that God had for us while being in this year, 2021. Well, I'm here to tell you that most of us have stopped looking. Some of us have stopped believing. Some of us have lost our faith. Some of us have lost our hope because of disappointments and things that have happened in our life. And God wants you to know, son, child, I want you to believe again because I still have another gift that I want to reveal to you before you step into this next year. Amen? Amen. And, And so... I want to go here because there's this gift that I want to break down today that opens the door for God's super to be placed on your natural. 
There's a gift that I want to talk about that opens the door to, to something so powerful where you're able to extract anointing out of you that you didn't even know was there. I want to go to John 13. John 13, verse 5. It says, after that, Jesus poured water into a basin, and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. This was unheard of because only servants did this, not the king of kings and the lord of lords. People would walk into people's houses, and the servants during this time and in this culture, they would be the ones responsible to wash people's feet because people didn't have tennis shoes back then. You know, people didn't, you know, there wasn't no cars. People usually walked for miles and miles at a time, and the, the roads weren't paved, and, you know, animals would, and, and livestock would come down these roads and do what they did. And, and sometimes if you, in the middle of the night, you walk a mile, you're like, okay, here we go. And you just, you walk in and you step in and all type of stuff. It's nasty. It's nasty. And back then, you know, they didn't really have the, the, the you know, the high-end nail salons and, you know, people wasn't getting pedicures. You know, feet back then was a little different. <laughs> feet was kind of similar to Jurassic Park. It, it, uh, it didn't look like the feet today. So what Jesus is doing is a very big deal. He's literally becoming a servant and he is about to step into the situation that you need all the love in the world for, okay? It says, after that, he poured water into a basin. He begins to wash the disciples' feet. When you see that, that's just easy for you. It's like, oh, he's just washing feet. No, this is a different type of feet, different type of feet. And he begins to go to the next level. He wipes them with the towel, which, which was girded. He begins to clean the disciples' feet. There is a lot of feet. He has 12 disciples. How many feet is that? 24. That's 24 feet. He begins to clean each and every, okay, I can't get into the details, it's getting nasty, okay. Anyways, <laughs> he cleans the feet, and the dirt comes upon him, and I just want to let you know that God is not afraid of your dirt. Just how Jesus was taking his time cleaning each and every disciple, Jesus wants to take his time with you, because a lot of us are ashamed of our dirt. A lot of us are hiding our dirt. Some of us try to say, okay, well, God, God likes this part of me, but God is so disappointed with this part of me. But Jesus takes every part of them and begins to clean their feet. And I just want to let you know that he's not ashamed of your dirt. He's not disappointed of your dirt. That when he looks at you, he doesn't see the failures and the mistakes that we see. When he looks at you, he sees his beloved, his child. It says that he begins to wipe them with the towel which was girded. And then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing now, you do not understand, but you will know after this. And Peter gets, you know, he gets religious, you know, he, he wants to have the right answer before God. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus responds back to Peter and he says, if I do not wash you, if you do not, this is what God is saying, if you do not allow me to love you during your darkest hour, if you do not allow me to bring healing to this area of your shame and your brokenness, if you do not allow me to touch your pain, if you continue to just keep me as this religious figure in your life as opposed to a loving father, this is what's going to happen with you. He says, you have no part with me. This is very important. You have no part with me. There are some of us that love Jesus, but we actually have no part with him. We're not truly connected to his spirit because Jesus has left a gift. He's given us this gift. But just like Peter, we, we think it's the right thing to say, Jesus, no, 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 Jesus. I, I, I know you want to help, but no, I, I got this. You, you don't have to wash my feet. I, I, I got this. We, we respond to Jesus, no, Jesus, I got this. I can run this business on my own. Jesus, I'm good. I, I, I got enough faith. I, I'm strong enough. Jesus, I, I can raise these kids on my own. Jesus, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm good, Jesus. I have this, this addiction. I'm, I'm, I'm working it out. Yes, I was hurt. Yes, I was rejected. Yes, there's this pain in my heart. But Jesus, uh, I'm okay. I'm okay. You stay there. I'm going to be over here. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to work it out. I'm going to be a good soldier. I'm not going to have a bad attitude. 
And some of us have this relationship with God where we can't believe for his best because even when we begin to pray, we say, you know what, I shouldn't even pray about this. There's so many people, come on, there's so many people across the world dealing with way tougher things than me. What, who am I to bring this? No, I, I'm okay. And it's literally the same thing when Peter said, Jesus, you shall never wash my feet. There's other feet here that's more important than me. Why don't you just wash their feet? I'm okay. You don't have to wash my feet. Peter thinks he's doing Jesus a favor by saying, no, 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 focus on everybody else but me. And many of us think we're doing Jesus a favor by saying, no, 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 no. don't focus on me, God. Focus on all these other people. They need you more. And Jesus responds to Peter and is about to break it down to you and I and says, Peter, child, you don't understand. If you do not allow me to father you, if you do not allow me to love you in your dirt, if you do not allow me to cover you right now, you are never are going to be able to tap into my power. You are never going to be able to connect in my spirit. You are never going to know me intimately. You are never are going to be, be able to be led by me because you will have no part with me. And many of us have hit a spiritual ceiling and we didn't even know. We've come to the end of ourselves. Some of us are tired and we're weary and some of us are on the verge of quitting. And it's because we've been trying to move in our purpose without this gift. We've been trying to move in this purpose that God has given us on our own. And God has sent me here to tell you this, that if we're going to level up, which is our phrase, our prophetic phrase for 2021, if we're going to level up before we even cross over, we have to open this gift. We got to open this gift. And a lot of us feel so unworthy to open this gift. We feel like we have to jump through hoops and we have to work more and we have to pray more and we have to, what do I have to do more to be able to be blessed with this gift, God? There's something on my part that I have to do. It was interesting because Jesus, you know, he takes the position as a servant and no one is working. No one is doing anything. You, people just have to sit there and allow Jesus to clean them. And it's uncomfortable. It's like, God, I don't have to do anything. You mean I don't have to work for something? I don't have to perform? I, I, I don't have to go the extra mile? No, you just want me to receive your love? This is so weird. And a lot of us are so uncomfortable to receive the love of God because there's something inside of us that makes us feel like we don't deserve it. That's what it is. We're uncomfortable to receive his grace because we are uncomfortable because we don't feel like we truly deserve it. And so we have to open up this gift. Amen? I accidentally just said the, the name of the gift. Uh, didn't plan on doing that, but it's fine. You didn't hear that. So this is the gift. Can we open the gift? This is Ephesians 2, verse 8. Here we go. This is our Christmas gift. Our Christmas gift with the name on it that is above every name. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. We don't deserve it. What is it? It is the... Say it again. It is the it is the gift of God. Grace. Everyone say grace. Grace means undeserved blessing. You see, it's so hard for a lot of us to open this gift. But once we under open this gift, we begin to understand the truth. And we begin to understand the truth that God. He loves us not because of what we can do. He loves us not based on our performance. He loves us not based on our behavior. But he loves us because we are his. We're his. Thank you. I'm about to trample over that. But he loves us because we are his. I want to let you know that Jesus came into this world 100% God, 100% man. He lived a perfect life for us. He went to the cross, and he died on the cross, right, to, to, to pay the debt of sin that was held against us. And so the gift is, is that when God looks at you, he doesn't see what you see. 
He doesn't see all of the things that you don't like about yourself. He doesn't see all the things that you criticize, uh, criticize about yourself. He doesn't see all the things that other people criticize you on. <laughs> Can I get an amen to that? He doesn't see that. What he sees is the finished work of his son, Jesus. He sees the finished work of his son, Jesus, and it is because of grace. Let me tell you this. The last words that Jesus had, the last words that Jesus said on the cross was, it is finished. He said, it is finished, meaning that anything that was standing in the way for my relationship with my kids, it is finished. And now this gift of grace is for anybody who wants to open it. Can we open up this gift of grace? Mm. I, I want to let you know that this gift is here for you every single day. When you wake up every single morning, you see, when I came to the Lord, I just thought it was a one-time thing. Okay, okay, okay. I get saved, right? This is what we do. I, I, I give my life to the Lord, right? And, 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 and then I, I kind of go on this high. Like I'm living better, I'm talking better, my family knows about my relationship with God, my friends know about my, my relationship with God. People are like, wow, you changed so much. And I'm like on this high, I'm on this high. I'm like, yeah, this is it. I got, I got it. I got saved, you know what I mean? I gave my life to Jesus. But how many do you know you could be here, but next thing you know you could be here? And they don't tell you that when you first come to the Lord. I, I thought, okay, well, I'm about to live good here on out. I'm not about to make any more mistakes. I'm about to live my life. I, I, I shut down all the relationships I got to shut down. But how many do you know when you hit that low, you hit that low? And I didn't know that there was another gift that I had to open up the next day. You see, we opened up grace one time. But I want to let you know about this great thing called grace. It's more than just for one day. This is what it says in Lamentations 3 verse 22. It says, this is what you need to hear. It says, through the Lord's mercies, which is his grace, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Everyone say every morning. Every morning. I don't care what's happening in your life. I'll take this. Thank you. I don't care. Sorry. I don't care what's happening in your life, even when you're going through the darkest hour. I'm telling you, every single day, there is a new gift of grace that is waiting at the edge of your bed. No matter what happened, no matter how much you blew it, no matter how many mistakes, no matter the ups and downs with your family or your finances, or, or maybe there's mistakes and failures that have been happening in your life, I'm telling you that every single day, you are greeted with another gift of grace. And some of us have to start learning how to receive the gift of grace. Let this be imprinted in your heart and in your spirit that every single day when you wake up, God wants you to see this. No matter what you, where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what fight you caused, no matter what stupid thing you said to this person, no matter what mistake or whatever you made, maybe God told you to do something and you didn't do it. And you knew he told you, but you still didn't do it. Let me tell you this. The next day you wake up, you have this waiting for you. How do we know? We open up the gift of grace. This is what I'm getting at today. How do we know? Because a lot of us don't understand this gift. Grace is not saying, okay, well, I'm going to do this because I know God is going to forgive me. That's not grace. That's called pride. You see, when you unlock and you open up the gift of grace, it opens the door for supernatural power in your life. When you receive grace, you're able to do things that you couldn't do on your own. That's when you know you are living in God's grace. Amen? Amen. So this is, I want to talk about this man real quick. His name is Paul. Everyone say Paul. Paul writes a lot of the New Testament. I mean, he, he's, a, he's a man of God. I mean, God uses him mightily in his ministry. But there's historians that believe that Paul actually suffered from an eye ailment. That he, there was, there was this, this eye situation that he was dealing with that caused a lot of discomfort towards him during his ministry. 
And so Paul is in this place, just like many of us, he's been going through this health situation. He's been going through this emotional distress. He, he's been suffering in his mind. He's been going through it probably with certain relationships. And he is praying to God. He is before God. And he's saying, God, you, you got to do something with this. You, you got to take away this issue. I cannot live with this issue anymore. If you want me to do what you're calling me to do, God, you're going you're gonna to have to deal with it. You're going to have to deal with this. You're going to have to deal with this fear. You're going to have to deal with this insecurity. You're going to have to increase my gift because I can't do this. And Jesus is about to introduce the gift, a gift that he didn't even know was there. And many of us, God is saying, I'm about to introduce my gift. Some of us have come to the end of ourselves. This is the end of the year. A lot of us are so tired, right? We've been through so much, and God is saying, it's time for you, child, to learn how to take advantage of my gift, because in my gift, it unlocks supernatural power to help you in every single season of your life. So this is what it says in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times. How many times have you prayed about certain things in your life? More than three. Can you preach it? More than three. Let's do three times that minute. You know what I'm saying? Uh, he pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from him. And, and this is what Jesus said to him in verse 9. It says, and he said to me, my grace, everyone say grace. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength. Here we go. This is what I want you to get today. Woo! For my strength. <laughs> is made perfect in weakness. You see, God is, God's grace is attracted to our weaknesses. But in order for us to see God empower us, we have to invite him into that situation. That's called humility. So if you're dealing with this fear, God, I am struggling in this area of fear. Lord, I thank you for giving me your peace. If you're dealing with anger, God, I thank you for softening my heart and dealing with my heart so I can talk to this person the way I'm supposed to talk to this person. God, I thank you that this urge that I'm feeling right now, I want to do this thing that, that, that I shouldn't be doing. I want to look at this thing I shouldn't be looking at. I want to talk to this person I shouldn't talk to. God, I thank you for giving me power to have self-control. Lord, I thank you. Lord, Lord, I, I, I'm dealing uh, with this insecurity. God, I need your power to cover me. You see, God's grace looks at our weakness as an opportunity to showcase his glory. I'm going to say it again. God looks at our weaknesses as an opportunity. It's on you. As an opportunity for him to showcase his glory. We are ashamed of our weaknesses, but God allowed us to have these weaknesses so that it would compel us to move to him. We are ashamed of our weaknesses that we have. We want the weaknesses to disappear. But God is saying, no, 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 I want to use you in spite of your weaknesses. I want to use you in the midst of these weaknesses so that my glory can shine through you. I hate it, as I've said this many times, I've hated speaking publicly in school. Like, I just didn't like doing it. I would freeze up. I, I would, my face would look weird and I'd be anxious and the class would be looking at me. I just, I hated class presentations. I just couldn't do it. It was so humiliating, and I had to do it. Even in college, I, I hated doing it. And so, you know, when God called me to do this, I said, Lord, if, you go, if I'm going to speak, you know, you know, and speak your word, like, I deal with nerves. I'm an, I, I deal with a lot of, I would go on auditions, even as an actor, and, and literally nine out of ten times, I would, like, have an anxiety attack in, in the audition room in front of people. I mean, I've had so many weird moments. <laughs> I've had so many humiliating, weird moments. Where people are like, thank you. We'll, we'll call you. <laughs> and I'm like, dang, I know I didn't get that one. So for me to be here to do this, I said, God, you're going to take away my nerves. You're going to take away my anxiety. God said, look, how about this? How about you trust me in the midst of your situation and just do what I've called you to do? I've called you to preach the gospel, so you just preach the gospel, and I'll show up. So even what I'm doing now is supernatural. I'm, I'm tapping into the supernatural anointing of God. And it's very humbling because I know outside of the anointing, I can't do this. I cannot do this. Oh, my goodness. I'm I tried many times. I've tried many, many times to do this without God. And it was the worst humiliating moment of my life every time. I, I'm so humbled. I cannot do this without God. But I've learned how to say, God, not my will, your will. 
Father, you've given me this gifting. I'm not going to allow my fear to steal this gift from my life. I'm not going to allow this fear of rejection and fear of failure and fear that it's not going to work out and fear I'm going to look stupid in front of you. I'm not going to allow this fear to take me out of your will. And a lot of us have allowed fear. We've allowed insecurities. We've allowed lies from the enemy get in the way from what God is calling us to do. And the reason why is because we never open up this gift called grace. In order to move in grace, you have to trust God with his grace. You see, the reason why this is so important is because outside of grace, it's just you alone. It's just you alone. So, of course, you can't do this very thing because it's on you. Well, what if I mess up? And what if I do this? And if I start this business, what if it felt like everything is about me, me, me? What if I, I, I? But grace is about doing this together. Grace is about saying, God, I submit to your will that they may see you through me. And even if I fail, Father, without faith, it's impossible to please you. So at least if I do fail, I'm still pleasing you. Can we learn to please God more than caring about if we fell or not? Can we trust in his grace? In order to unlock the power of grace, you first have to trust his grace. We allow our weaknesses to disqualify us, but through God's grace, our weaknesses actually qualify us for us to receive his power. We allow our, like I said, our weaknesses to disqualify us. But your weaknesses get excited about that. Listen, your short temper, <laughs> your moodiness, uh, uh, the way you think. So, you know, sometimes you can act this way or do this or wh whatever your weaknesses are. Listen, allow that to be an opportunity for God to show his power. But you have to invite him in. You have to say, God, you know this is the area where I'm not good at, but I need your grace. Everyone say grace. God is not calling you and I to be strong on our own. He's not calling us to fake the funk. He's not calling us to fake it till we make it. He is calling us to get into a position and come to this place. And this is what it is. This is Hebrews 4.16. This is how we get here. This is how we open up the gift of grace. This is what it says. God is saying to you and I, he says, let us therefore come boldly. Everyone say boldly. To the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace, find power to help in our time of need. Every single day, we have an opportunity to come to Jesus, to come before his throne of grace and say, God, I need your power in this situation. I'm going to show you practically what this looks like. We're going to go to John 8, verse 3. John 8, verse 3. I want to talk about this woman that is humiliated. She's in a really low moment in her life, like many of us can go through, and, I'm, and the world is turned against her. This is what it says in John 8, verse 3. It says, then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such a woman, such a person be stoned. But what do you say? But what do you say, Jesus? It's so funny that other people can try to stone you, and we can get lost in what people think about us. But what does Jesus say? What does Jesus think about what you're doing? People will probably say, oh, you're crazy because God is telling you to do this or start this or create this. No, no, no. But what do you say, Jesus? So they said this testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down. I want you to remember this. this I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere. This is a setup. This is a setup. Everyone say stoop down. Stooped down. It's one of my favorite words now after I found out this next thing. Well, you'll see. But Jesus stooped down and he wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, Jesus raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. If you heard this teaching from me before, you, you've heard this part, that back in this time, rabbis, while they were teaching, it was very custom for them to be interrupted by a mob, bringing someone that, you know, uh, did a crime or, you know, did an offense, because the rabbis during that time were like judges, and so as a, as a rabbi would be teaching in the temple, there would be a mob of people bringing someone. They would say, well, what do you say? 
And the, and the rabbi, what, what, what the rabbis would do, because there would be dirt floors, they would stoop down and they would write out the sins of the person. And whatever they would write out, that person would be convicted and either get killed from that or, or go to jail. And so this is a normal thing. They're interrupting another rabbi who's teaching, but they didn't know that they were interrupting Jesus. So, so they interrupt him. He's, he's teaching. And he begins to stoop down. Now, when he's about to stoop down and write the sin, they, they think it's about to be about her. So they're, they're excited. They're ready. Like, okay, what was he writing? Oh, okay. But something else happens when Jesus is writing. It says, so when they continued asking, verse 7, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped. Everyone say stooped. Again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, there's a, there's a mob of people, a mob of men that are, that are circling around this woman in Jesus. It says, then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest to the last. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing there. Jesus, what did you write? Because it wasn't her sins. I believe Jesus was writing down the sins of everybody that was standing around. He was writing the sins of everybody that tried to judge her, everyone that tried to stone her, everyone that tried to come against her. Jesus said, look, I got you. Don't worry about them. And so these men are convicted, and they leave one by one. And this is what it says. It says, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing, standing there. And Jesus asked the question, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. I want you to see what happens next because what happens next is that Jesus is about to present to her this gift of grace. And I want you to see the evidence of this gift of grace. This is what what he says. Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Child, I love you. Child, receive my grace. But then something happens after that because when you open up the gift of grace, what's connected to grace is power. I won't say power. When you, you know when you open up the gift of grace because you're able to do things supernaturally. Something happens in your life. You're able to do something and, it's, and you're like, I don't even know how I'm doing this. I don't even know how I have the energy or the mindset or, or the wisdom. It's just God because you tapped into his grace. So what happens next is Jesus says, here's my gift of grace. But then he says this. He says, and go. He's, everyone say go. go. Neither do I condemn you. Condemn you. Go here we go. And sin no more. So he says to her, you can have my gift of grace, but now instead of me giving you a commandment, now I'm going to give you the power to live how I've called you to live. Jesus forgave her and said, you are forgiven. I don't condemn you. But then he says, okay, now with this grace, now live the way I've called you to live. Do things that you couldn't do on your own ability. Now do it through this grace that I just gave you. Amen? Amen. I want want to close with this. This is John 20, 11. This woman who was caught in adultery, many historians believe this lady's name was Mary Magdalene. And this woman was a prostitute who was humiliated. After she opens up the gift of grace, there's a transformation that happens in her life. God begins to use her, and she actually becomes one of Jesus' disciples. But I want to show you this moment because this moment that she's about to step in is going to change the world as we know it forever, forever. This is what it says. It says in John 20, 11, it says, But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. This is right after Jesus goes to the cross. They They put him in the tomb, and this is three days later, right? He rises again, but no one knows it yet. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And she wept, and then, uh, I just want you to see this. I just want you to see this. Jesus shows up in her mess and her dirt, shows up there in her darkest hour, and Jesus does something. He does an action. The Bible describes it as Jesus stooped down to her. Jesus stooped down to her. Now this woman is about to get in her purpose, and in her purpose, this is what she does. As she wept, 
she stooped down in the tomb. And God is showing me here and showing you here, if you can allow God to stoop in your situation, meaning to come to your aid, come to your need, to love you, then you'll have the power to begin to stoop down in your purpose and do the things that God is calling you to do that you couldn't do on your own. She received Jesus in one season of darkness, but now she's taking the light and she's becoming the light in another season. A lot of us are not able to get to this season because we can't receive Jesus stooping in this season. Jesus is stooping down to love us and we say, no, I'm good. I'm good. I, I can do this on my own. I don't need your help. I can do this, God. There's, we're uncomfortable. And so because we're uncomfortable with, with allowing Jesus to stoop down to love us, we never, ever see this season of moving in the supernatural in our purpose. So this is what happens. This, this is John 20, 16. Dan, you can come up. John 20, 16. Jesus appears, and Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have yet not ascended to my father, but go. Everyone say go. I want you to go. Let me tell you, women in this culture were like property. They didn't have the right to vote. They didn't have, the, they didn't have any rights. Women had no rights. People didn't receive from women back then. But God did something purposely to change the rest of history as we know it. And th in this moment, Mary becomes the first person in the history of the world to see Jesus resurrected from the dead. Not only that, God says, I want you to start the ministry right now. I want you to be the first person to share the gospel of what I did. You, Mary, you. The same woman who was a prostitute who was humiliated in front of everybody. The same woman who was on the verge of being killed and murdered, and she deserved it according to the law because she did commit adultery. There's things that we've done that we deserve. We deserve certain things that we do. She deserved it, and we deserved it. But in the midst of her pain, in the midst of her darkness, Jesus shows up and says, you're not disqualified because of your past, but you're qualified because of where I'm taking you. You're not disqualified because of your past. You're qualified because of where he is taking you. And so it says right here, he says, go. Go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. And it says that Mary Magdalene came and, and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. I want to let you know, I don't care where you've been, what you've done, your past, what you're doing now, what's in your life, the addictions, any bad decisions you are making right now. I'm telling you right now, Jesus says, I want you to open up this gift called grace because this is the gift that's going to change your life. This is the gift that's going to give you power to do things you couldn't do on your own. But this gift takes you and I to be vulnerable. We've been hurt by father figures. We've been hurt by fathers. We've been hurt by certain relationships, even in the church. And some of that has wounded us. It's, it's kind of gotten in the way of our faith. Can you stand to your feet? Worship team, can I have you guys back on, please? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Can we just receive his grace right now? Come on. Let's just have a moment with the Lord. You can just close your eyes. Just have a moment with God right now, just you and him. Come on, receive healing in your heart. Receive healing right now for yourself the areas where you thought you let God down, the areas where you know, God, I, I keep dropping the ball here. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the gift of grace. 
Father, you went to the cross so that we wouldn't have to. And Jesus is saying, I need you right now to get off of the cross. Stop paying for this. Stop paying for something that I've already paid for. Instead, I need you to sit at my feet and receive what I have for you in this season of your life. Take my grace upon you. When you wake up, before you start your day, I need you to take some time, take a second if you can, take a minute if you can and say, God, today I'm going to walk in your grace. God, today I'm going to walk in this supernatural power. I surrender. Everyone say, I surrender. I surrender my will for your will. I surrender my flesh for your spirit because I need your grace. Thank you, Lord Jesus.